Today we have with us Lynn Groves. She's the Director of Instructional Strategies for eFolio World and eFolio Minnesota. And we also have Trent Batson, who's the Director of the Alliance for Authentic Experimental Ex Experiential. I knew I was going to get that wrong. <laughs> Uh, and evidence-based learning, also known as ABLE. Thank you. I'm going to uh, attempt to start our presentation today, and in the character of many of the presentations we've had, there are two people who have similar but distinctly meaningful separate messages to share, and Trent and I have enjoyed the process of getting acquainted as we've gotten ready for this today and hope that you see the um, direct connection between our two parts this afternoon. Let me give you a little background first about the um, eFolio world scenario because it seems to be critical to bringing together what I'm talking about. And I'm not going to spend time demoing a tool for you today. I'm going to talk about the tool from the perspective of the topic. But should any of you be interested in looking at the tool or seeing more information, there are brochures on the front table that you can pick up later. And I'd be more than glad to answer those questions. In about 2002, eFolio Minnesota was a product that uh, was developed to assist anyone who is a citizen of Minnesota. Res residents, students, faculty, workforce center members, anyone to develop an electronic portfolio. It had at the outset more of a career-oriented focus. It was always used in education, middle school, high school, college, but it just had a, a reputation that was more career-focused. As we evolved through the use of it and had a great deal of success, the tool actually became a, um, a want to get a hold of by other states and other organizations. And so out of that internal tool that was part of the Minnesota State Colleges and University System grew eFolio World. Much of the success around individual portfolios has catapulted it into being used for program reviews and institutional assessment through the years. And as of about a week and a half ago, we had 110,000 plus users in the Minnesota product. As of Monday, we soft launched into our version two, and by the end of 18 hours of being live, with not a lot of promotion, because we're going through site migration in about a month, we had 160 some new accounts built, with not too much of a hitch. So we're enjoying the, the uh, good times of electronic portfolios within education, we're also enjoying an audience that seems to find the tools usable. But it's not about tools. And as we go through our session today, you might consider the question of how do you connect the evidence to the assessment and how do you move conceptually beyond tools into a, a focus that truly looks at learning because that's what portfolios are well positioned to do. Uh, the information that I'm going to be sharing with you bases much out of some pilot work that I've been doing with campuses, with programs, with students, and out of the greater work we've been doing within the state of Minnesota and throughout other states and their connections to us. So as I talk about the tool, I oftentimes use this inverted pyramid because it really helps to provide the scaffolding effect that we, we have value for within our tool. And it focuses very well on the owner of the portfolio. Whether that owner is a student, whether that owner is a faculty member, someone who's in the workforce, it is all about them. And it is a collection in their digital backpack of those items and objects that are critical to who they are and, and what they are displaying as part of their persona to a specific audience or to multiple audiences. And so as we look at this particular uh, diagram and we come back to it throughout the session, some of the things that we focus on have to do with that upward trend 
through the skill building of using portfolios to the point where they can be used for assessment or where they can be used for quality improvement. But the focus is really at the individual level on the lower three tiers of the scaffold. And so that's where I'll spend the largest amount of my time with you this afternoon. When we look at the um, focus of the content within the sense of the digital collection, there are some guides and support for the process that we find are necessary. Uh, while you can certainly dive into a portfolio tool and be using it, and using it quite admirably for that matter, it always helps to have a little better idea of why you're going the direction of using a portfolio. And so we have a, a simple mantra that we try to share with people about how they would collect and select their data, the value of reflection, which we'll highlight a little bit more later, and then the concepts behind building a site and publishing it and what the considerations are for that, because there are many. And to a new user or to a casual user, they might start adding artifacts and adding evidence to a page without really following a storyline or without really following a, a format that will help them use this, particularly in the education setting. So a lot of the comments from this point forward are going to relate to the student and instructor uh, process that happens or that needs to happen. But keep in mind that this can be used for professional development planning. It can be used for workforce readiness and career searches as well. I just want to focus our comments today so that it makes sense as I play this forward. So as a student is getting ready to create their portfolio, the tools are fairly um, intuitive. It's not too difficult to add and upload files content. It's not at all difficult to drag things onto the page. Those things all happen quite nicely. But it's the thought and planning that goes behind it that is a part of that process. And it not only happens at the student level, as you'll see in a bit. So when we're working with electronic portfolios, one of the things to set the parameters for right away is what kinds of content can go into it. And certainly a portfolio in today's environment should be able to incorporate and integrate all of the kinds of learning experiences and interactions that a student would have, not just to showcase themselves, but to show the process of their learning. And so when we're looking at a repository of content that a student can use in multiple ways, perhaps to satisfy a set of learning outcomes and objectives for a program, or even smaller yet for a course, or later to build out a uh, employment-related career search type portfolio where those objects are reusable and can showcase different views of their self, we need to be looking at how those items come into the portfolio. How can the things that I do in Wikipedia be a part of what I point to as my work, as an example? How can what I have documented and posted on YouTube be included? And deeper yet, how do I attach meaning to that through the reflections that I add to those artifacts? So how do I link them together and build those pieces? And so that interoperability, the interactive nature of being able to bring all of my experiences into this setting are critical to a complete portfolio and are especially important to today's student and to many of today's instructors. Going beyond that, we come to the portfolio structure itself. And we've learned that we don't want the structure to be constricting. We don't want it to force anyone into a particular mold. So the person who is being represented by the portfolio should really be able to design it, should be able to lay it out, should be able to compile it in a way that's going to reflect their best self. Now, I have to tell you that the best students to do this are the middle school students. They are not at all shy of how to talk about themselves and spin their stories. And it's delightful to watch that happen. Much of my life is spent in higher ed. So every once in a while, for a refreshing burst of, of um, good practice, I'll visit the fifth and sixth graders at one of our middle schools in Minnesota. 
But the, the purpose of being able to take that structure and work with it, for example, at a middle school level, and then work it through high school and then into college, is that students start to emulate this lifelong learning piece that portfolios are all about. And so as they start to showcase their own work and showcase their accomplishments, whether it's what books they've read in the library, whether it's a senior capstone project in high school for their government class, or if it's something they're doing to meet transfer curriculum requirements within a state, that can all be showcased within this tool. The framework needs to be consistent, the process needs to be consistent, but beyond that, you can have the latitude of designing your own um, story, your own self persona. Within our tool, we have the ability for one account to have multiple sites. We have the ability for multiple objects to be uh, uploaded or created. All of the objects, from a structural perspective, are mapped directly to the data types that are honored by the IMS portfolio spec specifications. So when you're thinking about portfolios being able to transfer over time, portfolio systems that likewise honor the IMS specs will be able to receive data out of ours and we will be able to import data from theirs. That isn't key simply because we do it. It's key for some of the dimensions that many of you are looking at. Mapping evidence to assessment is going to require some type of a database backing that has a skeleton that can be harvested field by field. And so honoring those data types and having some standards in place is important for that value. Then we go from that to being able to link objects together and I might actually build out an entire artifact that's based on a description, multiple items that I've uploaded, a YouTube video, a PDF document, uh, an exit interview, along with reflections and feedback, and that becomes one item of many within my portfolio. So the structure helps to determine how it's built, but also how the background and the objects are woven together. <coughs> When we're at the learning point after we've dealt with getting the stuff in the portfolio and we've dealt with the structure and we're really pulling things into the process of putting them on a page or bringing them into sites, we have the capability to look at the deeper learning that goes on and to drill down into it. However, at the reflection level is one of the places where, at least in my experience, there are many ahas that occur. Some of them are that students need to know how to write reflectively. Big surprise, right? <laughs> but in those moments of working with programs and faculty to help them provide meaningful prompts to guide students to get good patterns and best practices of how to write reflectively, I oftentimes discover a moment for faculty development as well because not all faculty have had exposure to how to write reflectively. So when asked as a program to provide writing prompts for their students to follow, it's very difficult. And so for those of you who are involved in, in both sides, working with students and working with faculty, that might be a, a great powerful breakout session that you could do in your faculty duty days or that you could make into a, a mini brown bag lunch topic. If it works as well for you as it did for us, it'll even feed into that whole evaluative writing aspect that we need to do for accreditation. Reflective writing, bringing the objects in, all leads us into how do we plan for the portfolios from an instructional perspective. And being able to pull things in in a way that honors the outcomes, whatever set of outcomes we subscribe to at the course level, program level, institutional level. I simply picked AAC and use project list from the LEAP work because it's very generic. But I know that every program and every organization has the potential of board certification, state and national standards, and you need to map the curriculum into that in a way that communicates back to the student what some 
expectation areas are and where those exist. Not telling people what the actual artifacts are that they need to pull into their portfolio, but certainly helping them to know what would be appropriate to bring in to honor certain standards. In my work with faculty, I oftentimes take them through a backward design process where they're looking at the elements that are in their courses or their programs. They're looking at those standards that they want to measure or have evidence of. And then they identify the kinds of projects that occur throughout the program or course that could relate to that. That becomes a set that a student could consider in putting into their portfolio. But even beyond that, there's a deeper level of planning that faculty and programs need to go into. Because to pull this together meaningfully, to have some, some system where students are then compiling these or collecting these, whether it's through searchable tags as we have or through another mechanism of commenting that another program might have, you need to consider how you are going to assess and evaluate that. Feedback can occur by peers. Feedback can occur by professionals and invited users. Feedback can occur by external sources. In our tool, we even have the capability of editorial feedback, where if I'm a mentor to a student, I can suggest content changes, and they can accept it or reject it and have an audit log of what has been a part of that process. They can determine whether that's going to be displayed visibly on their website or not. They can control what elements are private and what elements are public. But all of that said, at the assessment and evaluation level, at some point, you have to know where you're headed. You know, the saying, if you uh, don't know where you're going, almost any word, road will get you there is very true in portfolio practice. And AACNU, again, has given us a great launch step to how to evaluate portfolios from 14 different perspectives. This first draft of a rubric they developed is uh, around the area of integrative learning, which is certainly key to portfolio practice. So you have that need at the assessment level to, to really think through the process from where you want it to be and then back fill it with what student work can achieve those goals and help show their work. And then you get into how to evaluate it. It's hard to skip through that so quickly because there's a lot I could tell you about owned information. Students actually have rights within their portfolio in our premise of portfolio practice. And they have to opt in to being searchable or opt in to having their data shown in a public assessment forum. But that can be accomplished through learning communities and groups as well. Eventually, you get to the quality improvement step. And at this level, you might be looking at something that you have to do from an accreditation perspective. You might be looking at a more holistic approach that your organization has. I would suggest that learning outcomes and program improvement are always a part of portfolio work. And that assessment and communication and professional development are outgrowths of it that are very natural, but they aren't the main message of portfolio work. So we come back to the question that I started with at the beginning, and that is how do we address that gap in our work? And some of the things that we can do, I've shared as we've gone through these slides. Trent is going to share some others with you as he continues our presentation. But I'd suggest that one of the ways to fill in that a piece that takes you from the tools to the learning is to incorporate something that I call portfolio thinking. And it surrounds all of the pieces that you've been hearing about at this conference. Connectivity, security options, the engaged learner, planning for them to be involved. And I have to tell you that portfolios, for those of you who haven't experienced them, are one of the best personal learning environments to help students really engage in their work. A student just back from the military last spring was working on trying to share who he was within a whole new environment, and portfolios helped him communicate that. It has to be intentional. It has to provide a sense of self as we move into it. 
There are a lot of directions it could go. The technologies can take us there, but it won't get there without us having a plan that moves us in that direction. And with that, I want to transition to Trent. Okay, electronic portfolios 2.0. It's, uh, uh, May said the Alliance, it's actually the Association for Authentic Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning. Uh, and it's, a, uh, it's the professional association for e the e-portfolio community. So we're actually seeing e-portfolio uh, developers and trainers and implementers as a new profession. It's such an important technology. but. Going back to um, connecting up with, with what, what Lynn was just saying about the value of ePortfolio. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been, uh, you know, ePortfolio I think is a, an, an enabling technology for a lot of the changes that are occurring. I think people are recognizing that the, you know, the passive subject student who just sits and absorbs knowledge is, you know, pretty much a, uh, not something that people recommend a whole lot anymore, and that we're moving more toward giving students agency, that they are an active agent in their own learning. Um, I think a lot of people agree with that, and yet, you know, if you walk around most campuses, you walk up and down the halls, as I have done many times, and you listen to the classes, it's usually just one person talking. So it's. It's something that I think a lot of people want to do and are trying to do, and a lot of people are doing it very, very well. Uh, but that probably we, you know, have the majority of people still to go to figure out a way to to make this change. It kind of, you know, changes uh, people's thinking from this is what I'm going to cover to these are the activities the students are going to uh, engage in in order for them to learn what I would have told them. You know, if they themselves can discover those truths through their activities, then I am a good designer and a good guide on the side and not a sage, sage on the stage. So, you know, if you tell someone something, they might remember it, might think about it. But if you get them to do something, they're more likely to really learn. So you give them agency. And then they become, over time, we hope by the time they graduate or at some point during their, their, their college career, a self-directed learner. So another thing that I, I think of as ePortfolios, and as I, as I mentioned during the panel, uh, I was a teacher using ePortfolios in, in, well, they were actually portfolios because it was just paper then, but uh, teaching writing. And, I, and so I have firsthand experience of the difference between the classes I had taught for years before, not using a portfolio, and then using one. And the way I saw the students change uh, in there, because I, you know, if if a, if a student is given a bunch of assignments, and they feel bad about say two out of twelve that they've done, but then they get a chance to discard those and you know say, okay, I'm, my portfolio is going to be those ten that I really like, and this is why I discarded those other two and why I like these ten. If you give them that kind of agency, that really is um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a transformative experience for them. So, but we have like. Two faces of ePortfolio. We've got the, the 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 student part that I really like as a teacher, moving more toward experiential learning or enabling experiential learning. But then you also have the the ePortfolio responding to the need for institutions to gather data about the progress of students over time toward learning goals. And so the whole thing about accountability and defining outcomes and thinking what are we really teaching and how do we redesign the curriculum so that we you know, actually have it aimed in a, in a direction we all agree on and, and know about. So there's that, that need uh, on one side is the institutional's need, institution's need for data, and on the other side is the, is the need for a tool that will enable this new, more mobile, nomadic student uh, that's uh, true of this uh, century. The values of ePortfolios, as, um, just to give you some sample, there's, there's many, many. But I, I think part of it is just this whole element of teacher trust of students. Uh, I think there's been kind of a, an adversarial thing set up with tests, you know, being this high stakes thing, and you know, you it, it you know determines everything, and so there's a lot of interest in finding out anything you can about the test ahead of time, or you know, during the test or whatever. So it's you know, we've kind of set up this thing where. The teachers trying to retain the control of the of the students and trying to control what they do, um, and and there's been that kind of adversarial thing, and um, but so when we 
now say to teachers, well, the students are going to go off and do work on their own uh, in groups, uh, and you won't be there. They're going to be working themselves, you know, in the evening uh, doing these projects, and you can't be watching over their shoulder to see that they're actually working. Um, we need then some sort of ways that teachers can follow this. And so if they can see the evidence of the various iterations of work, work in pro progress, they can share in this group's work. They can be one of the people who has permission to see that work going on. So if you, if you have a, a lot of ways for teachers to see and to track more in their own mind, you know, of who's doing what when. And if we've got a collaborative group, you know, we want to see who's doing what, everyone is doing work. So the more you have what Randy Bass calls, you know, visible knowledge, you know, actually seeing the process of learning as it goes on, uh, then, then you can start, the teacher can develop trust of the students. It, you know, I mean, trust of the students to the teacher is another story, but, but, but I think that, that is kind of necessary, is to have teachers beginning to trust this whole new individual learning uh, approach or group learning pr approach. And so, of course, uh, the value with an e-portfolio, if you, if you design your course around an e-portfolio, is that you're moving from the old style of, teach, of students parroting back what you said instead to collecting evidence of their own work. And another nice thing about e-portfolios is that if, if it's set up so that the students own the e-portfolio the e and it stays active between courses over the summer, uh, that then they have a continuous process of growth and they can themselves see progress over the years. It's not broke up like a course management system is into, you know, there's the cor this, this course, that's the end, everything's lost, now we start all over again. And that's that sort of course segmentation. Uh, and yet we want to talk about continuous learning. So, uh, and the e-portfolio is a tool that enables that, that continuity. Um, and as I was saying before, I think once you can start to show the evidence of the work that you've been doing, then that begins to legitimize the whole move toward collaborative and experiential work, is that there is evidence of it. You can track it. You can see the, the dialogue in a wiki. You can see the uh, different contributions. And so it, it means that you don't have to essentially be locked as much to the classroom where you can see students' work. You can instead design work that the students will be doing, but that you, you know, demand that you be able to see some evidence of progress from time to time. And then it, um, using ePortfolio, because it's a collaborative tool, because you can set up groups in the ePortfolio and, and give permission for people in that group to see you know, the work that you're doing, so you can set up groups of five or 10 or 20, uh, then that, that helps them to begin to learn how to be co-learners, to like, go back to what humans are naturally, which is cooperative beings. I mean, that's, that's how we survived. We don't have very sharp claws. We have ridiculously small teeth. We have no armor. We don't even have feathers. Uh, you know, we, we, we survived only because we're cooperative. That's, that's the essential nature of humanity, is being cooperative. So, you know, to some extent, what we're, what we're pushing now in education is the natural human state. And then, of course, as I said before, it the ePortfolio can provide um, data to institutions for them to track progress toward, toward learning. Now, if remembering that, that two faces of ePortfolios, um, where the current state is now in the United States is that most of the money, most of the effort, most of the work is being done around gathering institutional data. Uh, we call them assessment management systems. You can call them accreditation management systems. It's when the, the institution is forced somehow to show this evidence of progress or learning goals that then often institutions ramp up and get a system in place and then, you know, they've satisfied the institutional survival. And then as you look toward the right, uh, a student-owned module of that you know, massive uh, data-driven thing uh, is less common and then in, in most, on most campuses across the country, poor students, you know, having a separate e-portfolio is rare, fairly rare. And then the uh, use of anything coming out of Web 2.0 on the far right there, that's almost, you know, that's very, very rare. That's, that's, and if, if this was to scale, that would be more like a period dot than, than, um, than, than that other the circle. <laughs> And I think, you know, if you just reverse it, that's where the transformative value works uh, or, or lies. That if you reverse what, we did, what you just saw so that the, and, you know, everything on the right is getting bigger and that on the left hasn't shrunk. It's just shrunk in comparison to the other work. You still need to do the institutional data gathering, 
thought we should be doing a lot more with having a really usable, good usable uh, student module or a separate student e-portfolio e and then also mining all those wonderful resources out of Web 2.0, those great intuitive interfaces, all the different services that are offered out there in Web 2.0. I was just uh, talking to the uh, woman from uh, Blackboard. I don't know if she's here right now, but uh, you know, she's talking about Blackboard strategy is to have four different e-portfolios uh, you know, for different purposes. That to me, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think campuses who say we're gonna have one e-portfolio system, period, um, probably are going the wrong direction. You know, you probably need different kinds of tools to support different kinds of uh, e-portfolio activities. You might have something that's a really nice authoring system. You might have something else that, um, you know, really good with graphics or something else that's really easy to move objects around if you're, you know, wanting to shift objects here and there um, to be applied to different learning uh, goals. What I'm thinking about, and this is one reason why we're forming ABLE, the association, is to start thinking about you know, you've got the seven layers of servers on the campus, you know, the application layer being the, the, the top, and of course the machine language at the bottom. Um, but if you start thinking of those seven layers and then think, well, maybe hey, we should have 10, you know, moving out into Web 2.0. Um, so that, uh, and PlugJam, I put it in there because that's actually a product that would enable one more layer of, of security, identity management between tools that are not tied to the campus already. Um, so that's another direction. And then um, assessment. I think we've gone over these kinds of things that the students assess their own work, uh, self-reflective kinds of things. Uh, the faculty can just determine in those massive data-driven systems if, they, if the students have, have satisfied that rubric. Um, and they can put the X in the, in the cell and in the, in the database. Um, and then Another nice way to, uh, for students to assess their work is to have the e-portfolio capstone in the course, and their presentation of their, of their portfolio at the end of the course is uh, their assessment of their own of the work during the course. So now talking about the association. I, having been involved with e-portfolios for 15 years or so, or with portfolios, uh, I can see that, 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 that the potential is unlimited, so that's why we're forming ABLE. We don't want we want to have some guidance or some professional association to certify what kind of work is, uh, you know, seems to be productive and what doesn't. We want to have certification for training courses or for what is an e-portfolio worker. Uh, we want to have uh, surveys and, and, and research done to uh, help vendors understand the direction of the market. Um, we see now a lot of proliferation. Half of all universities have some e-portfolio work. We have 40 to 50 vendors and a lot of proprietary systems. It's all uh, out there, everyone's heard of it, but everyone says, well, what do I do? There's just too much. And so we, we realize that there does, there does need to be some centralization at professional associations. So I've spent seven months full time doing nothing but getting this association going, and now we're launching. Um, and uh, it, we also think, I think, and I think a number of people agree that uh, ePortfolio is, I think, the tool of this century. And that the way, if an if a institution can successfully and uh, uh, effectively organize, reorganize its curriculum around an ePortfolio, that's a barometer of being web ready. That is a barometer of that we are actually moving toward this new century. Um, it's like, you know, like the canary is the indication of danger in the, in the mine, while the e-portfolio is the, is the um, first warner about, you know, first warning about, you know, not being prepared or being prepared. Um, so that's why we formed ABLE. And uh, some of the things we're doing, we're gonna have an annual conference starting in the fall of 2010. We're co hosting that with the, American, with the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Uh, we're doing strategic reports that will be exclusively for ABLE members, including sponsors. We, we expect to be influencing uh, the corporate market or the corporate sector about, you know, what we think is good direction for them and for us. Uh, we're going to be, you know, generating grant projects. Uh, we're going to have local and regional ABLE meetings. In fact, uh, we're in the process of forming an ABLE uh, chapter in Australia and New Zealand right now. 
um, because they have no other organizing force. So well, and well, not why not use ABLE as our center in Australia and New Zealand? Um, so that's part of the idea. Uh, and then we also expect that this will be the place where we will be certifying different training programs for e-portfolios, where we will be actually developing a common lexicon. So we all are using words that we can commonly understand and agree on that this, this word describes that particular activity or that particular thing. Um, so whether we will be right all the time or not is not, you know, it's just that you need to at least have some place like Wikipedia where you go and look for what everyone thinks is the authoritative answer at this moment, and then people can keep changing that. And on May 21st, we're going to be doing a webcast. Uh, if you are familiar with EPAC, uh, Helen Shen is one of the people working with me to get this organization going, and she is like the guru for EPAC. She's the main force. She's at Stanford. So, and so those of you who don't know that PB Wiki has changed its name to PB Works, um, that's still PB Wiki, but it's just got that new name. Uh, so that's um, that's going to happen on May 21st, and it's going to be at noon here in the east. Um, and actually, in terms of the organization, there are some people already at, at um, CASE who are members of our association. So I'm interested in, um, you know, U.S. higher education. It's a it's a marketplace. It's a it's a it's a capitalist market system, and and. Um, to the extent that you know the Minneapolis or the Minnesota model was developed sort of by the state and it's used in public education and that's great. Where is the sort of the market driver for for this? Because I don't know whether it's because I'm here at Case, but I see a lot of students who come in for vocational training um, who don't really appreciate the internal reflection and that style of learning and and as yet. Uh, I've not seen employers who are who are seeking out that kind of um, meaningful self-reflection when they hire their first graduate. Um, I wonder if you could sort of comment to me, sort of about where that where the market demand is for for this. Well, you go ahead, and then I'll. I was going to say, actually, employers are starting to look for portfolios, particularly if you're going into a field where you know the the work that you'd be hired to do is what you studied in college. Then then the employer does want to. See, I mean, you know, if you're a good architect, let's see some of your drawings. If you're, you know, going to be doing some artwork for, you know, for our graphic uh, stuff, um, and I, I mean, I actually have some speculations about that. That what would be, what might be more useful, because I, I, I agree with you that if you're just, you know, getting a job and it's just because you're a college graduate has very little to do with your major, then you know that employer doesn't want to be going through all kinds of stuff and figure, well, what does this mean? So a portfolio probably should do more to say, what does this mean? You know, what does this mean about the learning profile of a student over time? Can we just show a snapshot of what, where they were at the end of their first year, their second year, the third year? That would be meaningful because that would be an interpretation of a lot of dissimilar data. Um, Maybe I could add to that that the citizen model in Minnesota that does allow us to have anyone, not just public education, but anyone have a portfolio, has actually become an economic renewal um, part of work in, our, in the northern tier of our state. Mining was a very heavy um, industry there for years. It started to diminish over time. And legislatively, people have been interested in drawing new business, new industry to that area. And so just recently, within the last two years, uh, the legislature and some sponsors have actually put direct money into the product in the northern tier of Minnesota to allow it to be a draw for employers because through the portfolio they can actually see what skill sets are available and start to mine that data, again at an opt-in level, but to know, okay, what would the population provide in terms of demographic support for the occupations we're bringing to this area. And one year into that, they're starting to see some impact that has evolved from it. So when you talk about the model or how it, how it comes together, a lot of it is based on adoption and, and penetration. If you look at it school by school or program by program, perhaps not as much as if it's more on a wider base. I work with a lot of secondary schools, and uh, I've actually been involved with uh, 
faculty work group this year that's sort of been looking at the whole issue of e-portfolios and so forth at the secondary level. And I'm wondering whether our experience um, has been paralleled by yours, because I think we originally got into it sort of from a, a, a technical web point 2.0 2 sort of perspective. And um, a lot of the uh, rhetoric surrounding this has to do with it as a summative um, experience um, for students. And what we've discovered, and I'm just curious um, whether this has been shared by other people, is that it's a much more powerful formative tool than summative tool, and that the value of it, as we see it, is in the advisory and guidance process for students bidding at the beginning of their school career to help them plan out um, a, you know, a whole array of activities, academic and co-curricular and so forth, um, so that you, know, you have something to show for your time at the end of the process. You know, there's something that, to go into that e-portfolio of a meaningful nature. You know, but it's a, it becomes a challenge, a kind of agenda, if you will, you know, uh, for, for teachers and students working together you know, to create more meaningful experiences in, in, in schools. And we, we find this a very exciting possibility, I mean, and much more powerful than just, oh, uh, we're keeping a nice record of you know, work that you've done. You know, it, it's, as I say, formative in the sense of it's giving you a sense of you know, possibilities and challenges my thing growth yeah. to the right. <laughs> yeah. No, in in I live in Rhode Island, and Rhode Island all all high all high school students have to have a portfolio. Uh, they can't graduate without a portfolio, so they have to keep it for four years. Uh, and in the various school districts within Rhode Island, implemented Sakai differently, uh, the OSP Sakai system. Um, and at, at its best, uh, in say War West Warwick, Rhode Island. Um, they have used it just as you as you described, and it was as it was intended. I mean, when when the K-12 system, the Department of Education was first talking about it, they only talked about that formative value, that you know, seeing the students seeing their own work and you know, seeing a history and getting comments on it, and, and then commenting on why they did like that paper better than this paper. You know, that 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 reflective ability is what they pushed. But as as you pointed out, in the end. A lot of them, not just not knowing how to do that, be how to change their teaching to do that, uh, it ended up just being, you know, I have a final portfolio. Uh, I put in the mark there because I had to in order to graduate. Uh, students say so. You know, it, it, it's the um, the easy part, even though it's incredibly difficult, is the record keeping and the data management. And the hard part is transforming the curriculum to to fit in the e-portfolio. Speaking of it as a model. Um, in, in the Minnesota system, from that advisory and counseling perspective, it's actually helped us do what we call a life planning activity that brings students from secondary into post-secondary. In fact, there's an entire wrapper around the eFolio Minnesota tool called GPS Life Plan that was developed by one of our community colleges and now is available throughout the state that helps a student look at what their financial capacity, what their life planning skills are, what their educational prep is, what, what their life uh, style can actually bear in the college years to help them plan through that transition to college. And it becomes one of those carry through um, tasks that helps them enter the college life and successfully, part of a retention pattern, if you will. Question and an observation. Um, in looking at the, the question, um, and thinking about the question about the market drivers, and then also looking um, at the, the benefits um, of a new portfolio is uh, no doubt the multidimensional view it gives you of a person, um, learning experiences. And in order for it to be more than just a great thing to have done, for all the reasons that we were discussed in the session, um, I think the way higher education can help the uh, industry um, use it for a tool, and um, when I talk about businesses, is to use it as a tool for also acceptance into college. Um, there's been some criticism that, gee, why why aren't the prof you know why isn't business using this in the recruiting? Um, they're still using um, you know transcripts are using places like Monster.com, but it, higher education is not using it as a tool to recruit and assess you know, enrollment um, capability or success in, in college. So I think if we model that and show that it's a useful tool um, in the admission process, then perhaps industry will look at it as a useful tool in looking at um, hiring. 
very right on that. We have some um, middle schools that are looking at how to replace the typical report card in their IB curriculum with uh, portfolios for that very reason. But in order to have that process approved, people have to be able to accept it as they move up the ladder.